Public Access Television is not responsible for program content. This program is produced by Anchored in Faith Gospel Church of Oxford, Iowa. Reverend Linda Hahn, Senior Pastor. The latest release of our full-length cable TV telecasts are now prominently posted each week, beginning Sunday evenings on YouTube, youtube.com slash Anchored in Faith. Search for Anchored in Faith, all one word, in the search box for Smart TVs and Roku TV viewing. From Anchored in Faith Gospel Church in Oxford, Iowa, this is Anchored in Faith. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight, angels descending bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love, this is my story. My song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story. This is my song. time. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. I was blessed with two parents that were Christians. And so I was 12 years old. We were going to Assemblies of God Church and I was sent to a uh, Bible camp. And I thought, oh, this is gonna be just great. Uh, uh, Cause I was ornery. And for the first two or three days, I was like, yeah, this is just and so the evening, we had evening services every night. And so I went to the evening service. 
and I was infatuated with this little girl. Imagine that. And uh, she was a cute little blonde girl. But anyhow, I was infatuated with her, and so she sat towards the front. And so if you want to receive anything from God, the closer you get to the front, the more you're going to receive. And not remembering that, so don't try to crucify me over this, but I don't remember uh, where scriptures are at. But the Bible says, if you draw nigh unto me, I will draw nigh unto you. And so, dummy me, I didn't know these scriptures, you know. I didn't know what was going on. So I got to the second row and got as close as I could to this little girl. And thinking, boy, now I'm going to get some. I'm going to get a kiss from her, you know, 12 years old, you know, or whatever. And, and I'm gonna, that's going to be my girlfriend. And little did I know that God had planned a plan for me. And so the service went on, and I'm sitting there, and I'm just kind of Googling eye over. And a few of the words started going through me. I started getting some of the message, and pretty quick, I quit staring at her and started listening to what the speaker had to say. And he said, if anybody would like to receive salvation, please come to the front. And I thought, maybe this is what mom and dad were talking about. So I got up and went. I got up front, and this guy looked at me, and he says, do you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? And I said, sure. And so he had me say the sinner's prayer, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, and I prayed a little bit, and he looked at me, and he says, so how do you feel? And I thought, well, I feel like the same little brat as I was before, you know. And he said, he leaned over, and he said, how would you like to receive the Holy Spirit? I said, well, uh, I don't know about this. And he says, if you just ask you'll receive. And I said, okay. But you understand, I was reluctant about this whole thing. I didn't really want to, I don't know, get into this. I'd heard my mom and dad, you know, and I'd heard them give prophecies and, you know, and this, that, and the other thing, but this is me, you know. And I said, you know, okay, just to please the speaker. Uh, see, see, this is how things happen. God has a plan for you. And just to please the speaker, I looked at him and I said, okay, I'll, I'll go through this. I'll follow your shoes. I'll, I'll take whatever you want. And he says, just go over there on that bench and kneel down and say, and raise your hands up and say, Lord, I want to receive the Holy Spirit. And I was like, okay, whatever, you know. I wasted time, but I'll do it. I went over and I, I knelt down in front of the altar. The tears started running down my eyes. And I said, what is this? You know, I don't do this. And the next thing you know, I said, Lord, if it's for me, if this is what you want me to have, and... I didn't even get to say the rest of it. And the next thing I know, I was speaking in a tongue that I didn't even know. Where did this come from, you know? And this went on for about a half hour. And I got up in the past, and the speaker, I can't remember, to save me, I wish I could. He says, so how do you feel now? I said, I feel changed. I feel different. And the whole problem was the little blonde girl didn't mean nothing to me anymore. 
God had, had, had a plan. So, from that point on, I'm not going to say I was a perfect little angel because I was far from the perfect little angel. I've done just about a little bit of everything. But I never did anything really super bad when it came to drugs, but I liked my beer and I liked, you know, my whiskey and I liked to drive my cars as fast as I could and, you know, and things like that, you know. But in the back of my mind, there was always Christ, you know, pulling at me. And so when I was, finally I turned 18, 19 years old, my mom and dad gave me my first real King James. It was a, Tom I, I still have it. It's a Thompson chain. When my mom and dad gave that to me, something of the Holy Spirit even hit me harder. And I still wasn't that perfect angel. I still wanted to go out there and carry on. So this morning, I'm very slowly and quickly, I'm removing myself from Facebook. I'm just not, I'm tired of seeing all the junk. I'm tired of telling me Christ is coming. I'm tired of telling me this is what the Bible says. I'm tired of being told, you know, and, and I understand I, I, the, the people are doing it. I understand why they're doing it. They're trying to get some sinners to understand what's going on. But to me, I get tired of seeing it. I need more in my life than that. So this morning I get up and I was like blown away because this guy was one of my classmates years ago and he's down in Fairfield. He's one of those guys that wants to cross his legs and fly. So anyhow, he puts this, po he puts this page up this thing that says, King James I was the one who interpreted the Bible. He was the one that, that's what it said. Now, I haven't had a chance to really research it, but he was the one who, in, who interpreted the Bible into the King James. And I'm sitting there and I'm reading that. Okay, that's pretty cool. And he says, but you ought to also realize he was a homosexual. And my heart sank. And so here's what happens when you see something like that. It shocks you so bad that you become to the point where you go, oh, must be true. Well, I took a little time out and looked over, see who King James the first was, you know, and I wasn't impressed, and, and I didn't find anything that said he was a homosexual. But here's the thing. If he was a homosexual, he wouldn't have went in there and wrote about Sodom and Gomorrah. He wouldn't have went in there and wrote about men sleeping with men and women sleeping. He wouldn't have interpreted the Bible with that stuff if he was truly. So you see, you got to look at things in a perspective. So I just kind of let that blow away. But these are the things that are going on in our lives today. We are running around with a bunch of wolves that's in sheep's clothing and is continuously trying to destroy the church. A friend of mine from down in Washington, Iowa, called me yesterday, and we were talking. And we was talking about the deceptions and things that's going on in the world. And so uh, I said to her, I said, here's the problem. I said, if you are a true, true Christian, and if you really and truly know the word of God, you'll understand that there's gifts and there's things that give you 
the power to live through this this life. I got I, I pretty much use all have all the gifts, but this one particular gift is called discerning of spirits. And for some reason, that's been something that God has given me. So I have this little thing, and I don't know why, but usually I walk up to that person and I shake their hand. And there's this little vibration I get, or something. I don't understand what it is. And immediately, God gives me what I want to know. And then I walk away, and I know whether to be around them or not. And so she was telling me that there was this couple that had been coming to their church, and she started describing them to me and, and said, they know you. Oh, they know you. They think you're just the greatest. And I was like, okay. And so they started describing. And I said, those are the people you don't want to be around. She said, well, they think you're just absolutely the tops. You and Bob Newton and, blah, and, and Sean Strong. And I said, no. I said, this is not how this works. They're not what you... And, and so we're living in a day and an age where if we don't have the Holy Spirit moving in our lives, and if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12... Uh, it tells about the gifts of the spirits. And, I, and those 12 gifts are very important in your life. You wonder why you have situations in your life is because we're listening to too many demons. We're listening to too many wolves in sheep's clothing. But the other thing I'm finding out is I, I, I run across a lot of people that tell me that they're Bible educated. You know, and... I sit there and I listen to them. You see, you have a verse. It says, draw nigh unto me and I'll draw nigh unto you. Well, what does that first two verses say? And what does the last two verses say in between? And then you get the full description of what the person, the prophecy or the apostle or whatever, was trying to tell you. And so we live in a, in a day and an age where everybody, they, they quote a scripture and you're supposed to be like, oh, yeah. And, you know, like I, I remember years ago, this woman, she, would, she always quoted an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And, and if, the eye, if the eye can't handle looking at a sin, then pluck the eye off. And, and, and if the hand has a problem, cut the hand. I'm like going... And, and people are so deceived by these things. We have mega churches right now that are absolutely destroying the world. I, I, there's one preacher going around right now, and he's he's on the he's on the news all the time. You can read about him just about any time. And him and his wife. His wife got in a big fight on an airline jet. And, and, I mean, yeah, and, and it's just, it's ridiculous. And our old-time preachers who preached the word and said it straight to us, they didn't fluff it. But here's the problem. Today's church, today's mega church is, is oh, yes, God loves you. God wants you to have the best. God wants you to be rich. God wants, God forgives you. God this and God that. But he don't tell about how Paul had to go through yes. hell, yes. how Paul had to be locked up in a, in a dungeon. He don't talk about how Job, who was, to in our day and age, would have been a multimillionaire and lost everything and still stood up for Christ, still stood up for God. 
and and he don't and he don't talk about how that his three best friends and his wife were saying curse God and die. We don't hear about Elijah and Elijah. We don't hear about Samson. We don't hear about the things that prophecy our prophets and, and and men of God went through. We only hear about God loves you. And God wants you to prosper. And God wants you to this. And God wants you to that. Now let's all say amen and go home. Oh, by the way, I'll be over this afternoon and, and make sure you have the Budweiser or the Michelob light along with the steaks. Now I'm not I'm not pulling no strings here now. I know a place I can take you to Christian houses and they've they, they've got money. Well I shouldn't say money, but they've got they're well off. And they got their refrigerator in the garage. And they'll say, hey, is there something you want to drink? Just go on into the refrigerator and get what you want. And you open up the door, and it's got three or four different kinds of beer sitting in it. And you're telling me how to live my life? You're trying to tell somebody how to live their life? We are living in a confused, deceived world. And as Christians, and, and we need to be have discerning of spirits. We need to be on guard with the Holy Spirit. We need to have our, our attack form ready. We need to know that when that sheep comes, that it's, not, it's a fake sheep. It's a, it's a wolf in, in clothing. We need to be prepared. And here's the problem. Pastor Linda's got five, six people in this church. And I would rather come here and have the five or six people here pray for me than to go to a church of 400. But the churches that are bigger are not as strong as what they say they are. The pastor is not as strong in the spirit as what he should be. He's not spending the time on his hands and knees praying and begging God for answers or for leadership or whatever. I, I, I read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 12, can't even remember now about the gifts of the Holy Spirit continuously. Because I want to be remembered and reminded in my mind what is available to me. You see, we get caught up in the world and we forget what, what we have available to us. If you've got a bunch of stuff going crap in the background and noise and stuff, you can't read the Bible. And that's what's going on. And to be truthfully honest, I hate Facebook to this point because it deceives us. It tells us, you know, and, and there's, but there's people in there that's trying and you get some good stuff, but there's so much bad that it causes you to question yourself. So, you know, well, hey, you know, everybody, all the other Christians go out and have a beer, you know, for dinner on Sunday after church, you know, and da-da-da-da-da, and this, that, and the other thing. We're being deceived. And the problem is, is Jesus is coming. And the day that he does come, the Bible says that there'll be very, there'll be a very few. Now, Years ago, I had a pastor look at me, and he says, I'll be lucky if four people make it to heaven out of my church. And he had a church of 250.
they're all great people. There's all wonderful people and everything. But you, know, you see what I'm saying? We give up things. We, we make things convenient for our lives. We make things convenient so we don't have to, well, I don't totally have to do this to receive this much from God. But then if they don't sacrifice, a couple of years later you find out, well, I never did get what God had for me. Well, that's because you've never made a sacrifice. You've never actually sat down and said, Lord, this is what I'm giving up for you. This is what I'm going to do for you because this is what the Bible has asked of me. If you take and you get into the theology of Paul, Paul spent 10 years getting his ministry. Why? Because he was up down. He liked to every once in a while maybe take a nip or every once in a while he'd get involved in some kind of shenanigans. And it was hard because I'm not, it, it's, being a Christian is not a bed of roses and things just don't totally change. Some people I can't believe, they just totally, it's a complete turnaround. But I struggle. I struggle to this day. I want to tell somebody off every five minutes. You know? And yet I know in my heart, the Bible talks, treat the person with kindness and love and understanding. But yet I want to just come over and say, I'll fix you, you know. And the Bible says, the Bible talks about being an imitator of Jesus Christ. Well, what did he do? He got mad, well, once or twice. But he always loved everybody. He went to parties. We read about it. He went to parties. But he didn't participate. But he did let them know about the love of God. But the plain simple fact is we are in dire need of the Holy Spirit. And if someone looks you in the eye and says, I don't need the Holy Spirit in my life. You need to straighten them out. You need to very calmly say, look, let me lay out a certain plan of what it says in the Bible so that you know. And I believe it's very, it's very strong to take and show them 1 Corinthians about the gifts of the Spirit because that, that's an important part of our life right there. Amen. This is your opportunity. If you have not accepted Christ into your life, you in this world you serve either the devil or you serve God. There is no in between. If you're not serving God, you are serving the devil. Receive Christ into your life. Repent of your sins. Turn away from your sins. Pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, I need you in my life. I ask you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. I repent of my sins, and I want you in my life forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. In addition to our postal address, Anchored in Faith Gospel Church has several electronic means to connect with you. Find our TV episodes at youtube.com slash anchored in faith. Visit our website at anchoredinfaith.org. Our phone number, which is area code 319-828-4815. Our email is tv at anchoredinfaith.org. And find us on Facebook by typing at AIFGC into the Facebook search box. We are actually a small church. If you call our 828-4815 phone number, leave a short message and make sure to include your phone number so we can call you back since we do not have caller ID. Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 
828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204, Oxford, Iowa, 52322 or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org. This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa. Stay tuned for Anchored in Faith sermons from yesteryear, delivered by founding pastor Rev. John Hahn and other evangelists. Anchored in Faith Classic is next on this station. Public Access Television is not responsible for program content. This program is produced by Anchored in Faith Gospel Church of Oxford, Iowa. Rev. Linda Hahn, Senior Pastor. The latest release of our full-length cable TV telecasts are now prominently posted each week, beginning Sunday evenings on YouTube, youtube.com slash anchored in faith. Search for anchored in faith, all one word, in the search box for smart TVs and Roku TV viewing. Mark 7, 24. From there he arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and wanted one, no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. When the anointing and the power of God is present you can't cover it up you can try and hide but Jesus tried to hide but they'll find you I had Lord God and, and neither of them were able to be here this morning because of circumstances work circumstances and so forth but I saw two tremendous miracles this week that God used me for two tremendous work miracles to raise off of a couple of ladies Different, totally two different situations. To start to raise on one start and two and the other one to raise a spirit of religion that had bound her for years. And be able to raise a spirit of religion on her that, so that she could believe that she was able to commune with God. Hallelujah. You can't hide. I wanted to hide. I didn't want to do anything. I just wanted to lay in the hole. Amen. Amen. For a woman whose daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him and she came and fell at his feet. And the one was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast a demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, let your children be filled first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this saying, go your way, the demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her, she found the demon gone out of her daughter, lying on her bed. Jesus says he didn't come for that Gentile woman. That he'd only come for the house of Israel. But she begged and she pleaded with him and she pressed in. She pressed into God, and he gave her even what wasn't rightfully hers because of faith. She, we're going to see something here that's unbelievable if I get as far as I want to in this. That's, that's unbelievable. We have a Greek Syrophoenician woman. This woman is not of the house of Israel. She does not know the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. She is not raised in the faith. She has not been taught and raised up. She has not been taught the Torah. She has not been taught the prophets. She has not been taught the books of the Bible. She has not been raised up in God, but she had enough faith to press in and receive when she didn't even reserve or deserve to be received. 
because she pushed. There's two things that you can do when trial and tribulation come on you. There's, there's two things you can do. You can move in and press into God and ask God to give you what you don't even deserve to get, or you can turn the other way and lay down, as we call it, in a pit of depression and in a hole. What do you mean the patriarchs never did that? Check out Elijah. What did Elijah do? Elijah had a great day of triumph. Great day of triumph. He just killed all the Baal's prophets. And what did he do? Went to a cave and sat in there and says, there's nobody left but me and I might just well die. Huh? God had to personally come down, step down and say, hey, Elijah, what do you do laying there in the hole? What do you do in a fit of depression? Aren't I God? Aren't I the God that raised you up? Aren't I the one that gave you the promise? Aren't I the one that did all these things for you? Get up! Get out of your fit of depression. Get out of the hole. Get out and face the battle. Press into me and I will deliver you. That's the spirit of this, of this Greek woman. A spirit of that didn't, she did not have rights to get, but he says, oh, just throw me a crumb. Just give me a touch of you, Jesus. Just give me a little bit of you, and I'll come through. Amen? Amen. Now, again, he departed from the region of Tyre and Sidon. He came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee, and then he brought him who was deaf and had an impendency in his speech, and they begged him to put his hand on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his finger in his ears. He spat and touched his tongue. Mm -hmm. Anybody got a hearing problem in here? Come on up here. I'll stick my fingers in your ear and I'll spit on your tongue. And it'll straighten right out. <laughs> he says greater things that you would do than he did. Wigglesworth did stuff like that all the time. It worked every time. Just like the fire of Phoenician, Cyro Phoenician woman, he'd press in. Believe in God, not doubting, but just pressing in. Devil wants you to doubt. He wants you to lay back. He wants you to say, hey, that's the silliest thing I ever seen. That's the craziest preacher I ever heard. That's the darndest thing I ever seen. They'd sing and dance and carry on and lay hands on people. That's the craziest thing I ever heard, taking a napkin that's taking some tissues that have been wiped on the preacher's head and covered with his sweat and throw them on the field and make corn grow. You just do what God says. That's no crazier than what Jesus did. That's the sort of thing he did. You didn't see the Pharisees doing that. You didn't see him getting healed either. Hallelujah. And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Etha, in Hebrew, that is, be opened. I can't say that Hebrew word. And immediately ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spake plainly. Immediately he was healed. Now, the brother who was here last Friday night had the same miracle, and he did it the same way. Did you hear him? He put his fingers ears, and he spat on his tongue in Mexico, and the young boy's ears opened. And he began to speak. And he was three and a half, four years old, something like that. Unbelievable. But it's God, isn't it? It is believable in God. I'll stand here and I'll say, that looks unbelievable. It is to us. But that's just normal for God. It's normal for God to be supernatural. He is supernatural. It's normal for us to be fleshly because we are flesh and we have a hard time understanding the supernatural. But that's nothing for God. It's just, he's God. In fact, we look at things that look so natural. I did this the, the other night. Me and Linda are out here marching around the building back here. We're claiming that building. We're going to own that building. The church will own that building because we march around it in faith nightly. Speak the word of God and that that building will be ours and we have a great camp meeting there in a parking lot and a bus barn and all the things that we need for this church as it expands and grows. And it will happen because God said it will happen and we'll just keep marching. Me, Linda, four cats and a dog. But the cats and the dog just lay and watch us walk. <laughs> They've got no faith. <laughs> they make one lap and they lay down. <laughs> It's like a ritual. It goes on every night. They do it again. He's 
supernatural. We're natural. Hard for us to understand him. What we'll say is unbelievable to us is just plain. Yeah, just, just look. Okay, so we were sitting there. I was sitting there on the sidewalk because I took it up with the dogs and the cat after about 40 laps. She was still going. I look it up in the heavens and I say, oh, man. Whew, look at that. Oh, there's stars out there and stuff. I don't understand this stuff. I don't understand a tree. I don't understand grass. I know that if I take grass seed and put it in the yard and put water on it, it'll turn into grass, but I don't know what makes it happen. I couldn't do it if I didn't have grass. I couldn't grow one blade of grass without God. Now, that looks natural, but you know, all this natural stuff is very supernatural. Just take your little pea brain and try and figure it out. You couldn't make nothing. We think that we make something, Eric. We really do. We think we did something. Oh, we overhauled that camper. We did a great job. One got, without God, you couldn't do the thing up. And he made the tree to use for the two-by-four. He made the tin to make the tin. He made all the stuff to make the stuff. Without God, you couldn't make nothing. All you'd have is nothing. This natural stuff is very supernatural. We should be able to understand the supernatural a little more because when we look at the natural, we can't understand it. I, I, Earl can plant corn, but he can't grow corn. He can't make the seed. he got to get it. I mean, you got to have... If you, if you didn't have one corn plant to start out with, you'd never have no corn. Amen? God had to make the first one. Amen? Even as humans, we say we make babies. Without God, we wouldn't have no babies. He's the one that makes all the stuff to make them. Amen? Very supernatural. What we call natural is very supernatural. It's just what we've seen so much of it, we just don't pay no attention to it. We, we just don't get it. Oh, if I don't get going, I won't get where I want to go. Hallelujah. Immediately ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. Then he commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what? I, I got something here to beat you up on a little bit. I never beat you up, do I? Uh -oh. Jesus at that time would tell people that nobody tell anybody nothing about this stuff happening and, and they go and tell everybody, amen and then he gives us the great commission to go tell everybody as a witness around the world and we won't go do it that's just the way that's human nature I should, I, maybe I will every Sunday morning from now on I'm going to say do not bring anybody to church next week whatever you do do not witness Christ because your spirit of rebellion, it'll raise up in you and you'll do just the opposite of what I say. And so then it'll probably work and the place will just be plumb full. <laughs> well, that's what he said. Don't go tell anybody what they did. Go tell them. When he said go tell them, well, I'll tell you what. The disciples did. did anybody have any notion of how far they spread the gospel in 20 years to the entire known world? world including china clear to china people even these liberal theologians say oh they just sat in jerusalem yeah they sat in jerusalem for about five minutes and then got on a camel and rode man get on your camel and ride clyde i mean they went they went to england there is don't get stirred up with Probably, <laughs> how come there is a set of Ten Commandments in South Carolina carved on two tablets that date to 600 A.D.? They're, they're there. Written, you know what they're written in? They're written in the Hebrew tongue of the day. We just don't know how big God is. We just don't know what all he did. Just because we think we know history, that's only the story of the one that wrote it. His story. 
you start looking at archaeological evidence and God has been, the gospel may have been here way before what we think. Because he's God. But the church today is just the opposite of what they say. Well, I'd tell somebody about Jesus, but, you know, they, they might not like it. You know what? The world don't like this. This country don't like it anymore. It used to be a Christian nation, but... Oh, don't want to say Jesus. I remember when my friend, the, the Methodist preacher, used to be here in Oxford. Harry Emily went to the school graduation, and he prayed in the name of Jesus. My goodness, they threw him out. <laughs> Poor old Harry, they threw him out. It was the biggest stir and the biggest mess you've ever seen. Made the papers everywhere. Sacrilege to pray in the name of Jesus in the public school. And that was oh, probably I, 10, 12 years ago, something like that. Some time back, my Lord. He was green in the ministry and just as fired up as he could be. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> it wore off. <laughs> He commanded them to tell no one, but he proclaimed, he commanded them that the more widely they proclaimed it. Oh, Lord. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all these things well. He make both the deaf hear and the mute to speak. Now, I want to get through this. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitudes because they have, not, they have continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way, for some of them have come from afar. Then his disciples answered him, How can one satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? Now, here's the beginning of, Woes, I would say, for Jesus. And the beginning of woes for a preacher in the church. The beginning of woes, the ones who've got their heart white with God. They just saw him, how many pages back was it? They just saw him feed 5,000 people. Now this time there's only four. And they say, where are we going to get the bread? That's how come we don't see as many miracles as we ought to see. We know we've seen miracles, but when it comes time for another, we start doubting again. He, they already fed 5,000. Took five fish, four loaves or whatever it was, spread them out, took back seven great big baskets of leftover stuff. Amen? They just seen it. They just walked with him. They just talked with him. Just a few minutes before, he'd stuck his head fingers in a guy's ear, spit on his tongue, and he started to talk and hear. Faithless. And this is the sad part of it. These guys are as good as it gets. They're the ones that walk with him and talk with him. All day long. Maybe they're too close to him. Maybe they saw some of the humanity of Jesus and didn't recognize all of the God that was there. Amen? My God. He said to them, how many loaves you got? And they said, seven. So he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, broke them, gave them to his disciples to set before them, and they set them before the multitude. Also they had a few small fish. And having blessed them, he set to set them before them also. So they ate and were filled. They took up seven large baskets of leftover fragments. Now those who had eaten were about 4,000. He set them away, and he sent them away. Immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and came to the region. Then the Pharisees came out, began to dispute with him, seeking him for a sign from heaven, testing him. But he, he said, sign deeply in his spirit, and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Surely did I say to you, no sign shall be given to this generation. And he left them and went into the boat again and departed the other side. Now, surely no sign will be given. He just had a sign of making all that bread. He just had the sign of that young man being healed. He just had to 
over and over again. Sign. He just had the demon. Demons are cast out. Bread is made. Fish is made. Ears are open. Tongues are loosed. And they come wanting a sign. <laughs> Give me a break. What do you want? How much of God do you have to see before you believe it's God? It's crazy. Crazy, faithless people. The world is filled with crazy, faithless people that are seeking a sign. They see a sign, and that sign ain't good enough. They want another sign. Amen? Then left them and get into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of, the Herod, of Herod. And then they reasoned among themselves and said, It is because we have no bread. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? How much sign must this world see? How much? Before they believe. How many blind eyes have to be opened? How much bread has to be manufactured before your eyes? How many miracles do you have to have in your life before you really believe it? How much do you have to see before that you know God is God? that Jesus is the only God. He is the one, the true, the living God, the creator of the universe the controller of your life how much you got to see I've been in places I saw blind eyes open I've prayed for deep people and had deaf ears opened I've seen cancers pass away I've seen people's financial lives absolutely changed by the power of the living God. I've seen marriages restored, families restored. I've seen every kind of miracle you want to see. Are you going to become greater than the disciples? And believe God when he, when he does it and, and not ask for a million more signs? Or be you like the disciples? He just saw him. I mean, the Holy Ghost, heavenly, supernatural baker, just baked up enough bread for 5,000 people. Amen? I mean, the aroma of the fresh loaves coming out of the heavenly oven can you imagine the smell of that bread being God baked it? How good it was? The smell of that fresh, anointed bread of heaven is still in their nostrils. They kept one loaf. They got it. There's only a dozen of them. What are we going to eat? <laughs> I know we ate heavenly bread yesterday, but he only got one loaf. What are we going to do? This same Jesus was in the boat with them. The same Jesus is the same today that he ever was. He's still in the boat with you. 
I'm preaching to myself. I got to convince myself he's still in the boat with me. Confirmed it this morning, amen, with signs and wonders and the power of the living God. What's this all about? It's about faith. You can see the signs and the wonders. You can see the miracles. You can see the change in your life. God can pull you out of the pit and set you up on a pillar. But the enemy will speak to you to tomorrow there'll be no bread. But hasn't he brought us this far? You know, another thing that amazes me about God is I'm preaching through this whole book of Mark and every Sunday the message fits and applies to our lives. I mean, I'm not, I'm not skipping and hopping. I'm not looking. I just go into that Bible and I preach what God put before me. Every head bow and every eye closed. I want to just ask this question this morning. How many believe if he fed you yesterday, he's going to aren't going to cry that there's no bread. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. You know that there's bread. You know there's bread from heaven. You know that it's surrounding you. You know that he's able. He's able. He's able. He's able. You, look on TV. He's able. He fed you yesterday. He'll feed you tomorrow. Just turn your life to him. Being a Christian is the simplest thing in the world. It's just saying, I give up. I give my will to you. I no longer will to run my life. I'm going to let you run it, and I'm going to depend on you to provide. And when you follow the principles that laid out in this Bible, your life will be provided for. This is your opportunity. If you have not accepted Christ into your life, you in this world you serve either the devil or you serve God. There is no in-between. If you're not serving God, you are serving the devil. Receive Christ into your life. Repent of your sins. Turn away from your sins. Pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, I need you in my life. I ask you to come into my life and be the Lord of my life. I repent of my sins, and I want you in my life forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. In addition to our postal address, Anchored in Faith Gospel Church has several electronic means to connect with you. Find our TV episodes at youtube.com slash anchored in faith. Visit our website at anchoredinfaith.org. Our phone number, which is area code 319-828-4815. Our email is tv at anchoredinfaith.org. And find us on Facebook by typing at AIFGC into the Facebook search box. We are actually a small church. If you call our 828-4815 phone number, Leave a short message and make sure to include your phone number so we can call you back since we do not have caller ID. Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 319-828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204, Oxford, Iowa, 52322 or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa. The latest release of our full-length cable TV telecasts are now prominently posted each week beginning Sunday evenings on YouTube. youtube.com slash anchoredinfaith Search for Anchored in Faith, all one word, in the search box for smart TVs and Roku TV viewing.